Okay, very good morning. It is Thursday, the 2nd of September, so I hope you're doing well. I'm going to cover some quite interesting things, actually, in terms of what's in focus in markets for the moment. Nothing too much for the actual open here this morning. Just before I begin, the overall flavor for market sentiment at the European Open is pretty flat. Equity index futures uh, broadly unchanged as far as the US is concerned, not real any movement seen overnight. The DAX future perhaps a little bit more interesting just in challenge of uh, some near-term support, as you can see here on the downside, which was the overnight APAC low yesterday afternoon low and the low from the 31st of this week as well. So worth just keeping an eye on that at the moment. Um, FX markets, the dollar index pretty un pretty much unchanged, and that's reflected in the major pairs in euro, dollar, and cable. Gold, flat, oil, down just a touch, 24 cents after some of the volatility seen yesterday amid the OPEC meeting and infantry data, and then US T notes bottom right also toward unchanged. But the reason why I think there's a couple of interesting things to talk about is Starting off with data, um, yesterday, uh, obviously, we got the things like ADP National Employment, we had the ISM Manufacturing PMI, both very important um, data points, not only for the overall assessment of the US economy, but of course, as we start to build out our expectations for the labor report, the US non-farm payrolls on Friday, of course, and ADP was a big miss, as you can see here, 374,000 analysts were actually looking for this number to bounce back north of 600k and that the July reading was somewhat of an anomaly and we had moved back up towards uh, pretty decent and robust job gains uh, over the last period uh, in the month of August but that didn't materialize and that then came in combination with the latest um, ISM manufacturing PMI and that came in at 59.9, which on the actual surface seemed pretty decent. The expectation value there was at 58.6. So again, uh, initial interpretation would be that that's positive. But if you actually looked under the bonnet, uh, importantly for payrolls at least, employment contracted. Remember, this is a diffusion index, and so sub-50 means contraction. Uh, and the number came in at 49, a fairly steep decrease from 52.9. In fact, that's the lowest in the manufacturing PMI employment component that we've had since November, so a long time ago. And so what did this mean for markets? Well, at the time, remember, the market trades this in a kind of monetary policy domino effect of what does this mean for tapering, essentially. And actually, at the time this data came out, as you can see here, probably most evident in the lights of the NASDAQ, which is particularly sensitive to the rate environment, i.e. big mega cap tech generally liking any signs of delaying on tapering and those that are more integrally tied to things like the economy like the Dow does the opposite and what was quite interesting yesterday when all these data points were coming out is the Nasdaq actually rallied at the time particularly post ADP at the open on Wall Street uh, and we actually touched all-time highs albeit that that then gave back those gains and we finished pretty much flat marginally positive in the Nasdaq but outperforming the Dow uh, the Dow, on the other hand, if I just switch over here, uh, in fact, we actually just saw selling pressure after ADP. So um, the actual same time frame movements here, you've got um, the response to ADP in the Dow here, the response really to ADP coming out in the NASDAQ here. So very contrasting um, here between the different equity sectors, i.e. the NASDAQ being proportionately technology-led, the Dow carrying names that are more integral to that of overall economic performance. But um, beyond that point, though, the, the interesting thing for the Fed, of course, becomes this idea and notion about timing over tapering. Yesterday, the dollar weakened post these data points as markets started to push back any idea of an accelerated taper program as had been put forward by the likes of some of the Fed hawks like Bullard, Kaplan, uh, Mester and others. Um, and so that has um, led to a bit of a, a footing for these equity markets, albeit um, we did, as I said, just drift into the latter hours of Wall Street off those, those best levels. Another interesting thing I thought to talk about, and something which probably is not on your radar if you're not an economist or a, a more experienced um, market participant, is 
uh, evictions and the risk that that carries in the US. And what I wanted to do is just give you a quick flavor. And really, this discussion point triggered by Feds Bostic. Now, Bostic is a voter on the FMC at the moment and also is of a slightly more hawkish disposition in terms of that spectrum between hawks and doves. So keeping that in mind of his general policy stance, he said he's worried about a wave of evictions from the moratorium ending whereby a surge would have a negative impact on the recovery. So obviously this is a little bit out of kilter from someone who typically would lean more on the hawkish side. Uh, and this definitely highlighting more downside risks to the economy, which would then result in having a more dovish spin to what he's saying. Now, what exactly is this and what is he referring to? Well, an interesting note came out of Goldman Sachs um, a few days ago, and it adds a bit of color. And let me give you the highlights. Essentially, landlords, this is in America, may evict roughly 750,000 US households by the end of the year. Uh, as lapsing eviction bans and high demand for rental housing push property owners to remove tenants. Context, currently, there's as many as 3.5 million households who are believed to be behind rent at the moment, with landlords owed as much as 17 billion US dollars. Remember, a lot of those jobs, things like uh, leisure and hospitality, Typically, some of the lowest paid jobs in America are the ones that have been hit most hard during the pandemic lockdown restrictions and therefore haven't been able to pay their rent. They've fallen behind. And why this has come about is that delinquent renters have been able to remain in their homes during COVID-19. But the Supreme Court lifted a federal ban on evictions last week. And remaining state and local moratoriums are slated to expire later this year. So it's almost like these people have been given a bit of a break because of the COVID situation, but that won't last forever. And it just so happens that there's three and a half million households who are behind on rent. And so this is, again, a key risk to think about, particularly if, as we have seen, the labor market recovery is being relatively slow. And so this idea of tapering, again, don't forget, you've got fairly high COVID case rates at the moment, which is putting quite a lot of pressure on infrastructure in some of the more populous states in America recently, in the likes of Florida, for example. And although that's moderated a little bit more recently, COVID is still a, a, a real issue in certain hotspots in North America, uh, as well. So there's a number of things here, which overall, I would say, in my view right now, would constitute the Fed taking a measured approach to tapering. Everything I've discussed are reasons for them to just coordinate policy normalization and commencement of that sequence of tightening in a very slow, very measured way. And that's why, for me, I don't buy into this accelerated format that's been uh, put on the table by some of the hawks. So yeah, just a couple of things there to be to be aware of. And, and again, rationale for why, even though we're tiptoeing into tapering, markets are not freaking out and equities still reside at around their best levels. Uh, the dollar's been a little bit weaker more recently. Again, a lot of the pressure point is going to come onto what's the quality of the labor report that we get from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on Friday, non-farms. Um, at the moment, given the moderation um, we've had in the employment constituent moving into contraction in manufacturing, ADP big miss, worse, in fact, than the most pessimistic estimate on the street, I'd say expectations for payrolls are diminishing at this point in time. And if that is the case, well, that, that further cements that view that I've just discussed. So hopefully this all makes sense. Um, some other things to be aware of oil markets. Um, we had a bit of a dip and recovery yesterday and really goes to show the volatility you typically see with a generally thinner market because no one really wants to step in intraday with a position of risk given the headline noise that can emerge out of an OPEC meeting. But it wasn't really anything too surprising to be honest. OPEC plus this time uh, they said they would continue the policy of easing their production cuts. Uh, no additional requests were made from any of the OPEC plus states to change their quotas, which had been a bit of a headache. You remember before it was the UAE, 
before that it was Iraq uh, and so on. Um, so no real complications at this point in time. The next meeting is planned for about a month from now, the 4th of October. So following that familiar routine of every month having a meeting. Separately, but related, Iranian oil minister has said that as soon as US unilateral legal sanctions are lifted, Iran is ready to increase its oil output to its highest possible level to compensate for losses caused by US sanctions. I thought that was quite interesting because I don't find it unsurprising what Iran is saying. They pretty much have stuck to that rhetoric from the beginning. Um, we've discussed before in previous briefings about it's not like Iran just turns the, the handle and then out comes the, the, the new crude oil supply um, because overall they've had a lack of real investment in the infrastructure. Turning the taps on like that will take a bit of time amongst other issues as well. Uh, but don't forget they can then bring back, say, stored oil in China, for example, if they really wanted to flood the market. So there is some credibility to the threats and the noises that they make. What I thought was quite interesting was the fact that if you remember, it's hard to remember it, but we were in several rounds of nuclear talks, the US led, with Iran. What's happened to that? Well, as you can imagine, nothing. Um, I remember a few months ago, oil was weakening. People were saying about this impending flood to the market. Iran were making similar types of noises to this. And we on the desk were saying at the time, we don't buy into that because the relationship that was broken down via the Trump administration to reestablish that, I think, was way underplayed uh, by the market at the time. Hugely complicated uh, in that region uh, and with that particular relationship in question. Uh, and we're seeing this play out at the moment. So for now, I still see any type of nuclear accord return to that 2015 agreement as well off the table for the time being. And the predominant reason why I think that is because at the moment there's Biden dealing with a very messy exit from Afghanistan. And that has really dented his opinion ratings domestically. So further um, involvement into more foreign affair related issues of which Iran would fit into that, that area, I think is the last thing Biden wants to do is waste time there. He still has an infrastructure bill to really see completely through Congress. He still has a looming large budget that needs to be negotiated and approved. And there's a looming debt ceiling issue as well on the agenda, all coming at a point where his um, his ratings are declining. So the last thing he's going to want to do is start talking to Iran at this point in time. So Iran's banging the drum, as I would do if I was Iran. Now's the time. You know your opponent is in a fairly weaker position, holding a softer hand. I want to assert myself. And so rhetoric like this, I think, is to be expected. Overall, though, connecting all these dots, I guess, with oil, um, OPEC supply, I think, will continue to come to market. I think Iran will talk. It won't make any difference, quite frankly, um, at least for now. Um, COVID does present a little bit of a risk, particularly in areas like China, for example, uh, as well as the US at the moment and other places. But overall, I think that areas like Western Europe and just generally um, that any weakness in that outlook generally would be mitigated by the ongoing improvements globally by demand. And I think that any dips into low 60s will be bought into as they were just a few weeks ago. So um, I still think WTI crude, there's enough to it in the kind of demand and supply dynamic to keep us at around the current levels that we're trading. We're trading 68 handle this morning. Um, the other thing is China overnight. The latest kind of regulatory crackdown spooking markets is this. Tech shares getting hit overnight in Hong Kong. Uh, they came off their highs after criticism of ride hailing firms. Uh, regulators allege that services are recruiting unapproved drivers and vehicles uh, and highlighting the risks then from the nation's ongoing crackdown on private industries. However, the Chinese market actually traded higher despite the weakness in tech. And this is because they had their chance to react to that news that we saw yesterday's session, which was that um, the PBOC is to supply cheap funding to banks in a dollar related value, just shy of 50 billion US dollars to boost small medium enterprise lending. 
Uh, other measures announced included interest subsidies to firms hit by the pandemic and a bigger role for local special bonds in driving investment. So this is a bit of a softer touch approach than just outright triple R movement or more definitive action on a policy side. But nonetheless, it's policy support into an economy that has been softening of late. And this is part of that reason why markets have kind of kept a degree of calm at the moment without freaking out about um, any any weakening in the Chinese economy of late, and particularly there domestically as they continue to confront the ongoing COVID situation uh, because of the fact that people are very much of the opinion that if things get worse, the state steps in. And as long as that is the relationship, there's not a great deal to fear on the downside, particularly then given the rhetoric they've been saying of late, given the route that we saw in the tech sector in particular more recently. All right, to finish off, in terms of the calendar for today, you've got Eurozone PPI numbers coming out at 10. Not really looking for too much Sorry, movement. I'm still not looking for too much movement on the back of that. Um, you've then got initial jobless claims um, happening at 130, expected at 345,000, pretty similar to the previous print of 353. Um, You've then got the durable goods, but these are revisions, so not too much interest there. And then US factory orders will be watched at three o'clock, expected at 0.3% for July, month on month, um, down from 1.5% seen previously. Bostic speaks again at 6 p.m. Um, fixed income supply coming out of Spain and France this morning with a 3, 10, 30 year um, note refunding announcement out of the US at 4 p.m. Uh, and that is it. So hopefully um, that was useful. Again, this morning's open overall on the charts, pretty flat. Most of the things I've discussed are more top level macro ideas and thinking rather than implementable, implementable strategies for this morning, so to speak. But hopefully all of that made sense. If you need to see my notes, you can check them out on my Twitter. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. All right, guys, have a good day and I'll catch you tomorrow.